you want to start with introducing yourself? Yeah. <clears throat> is my mic on? Yeah, okay. Hi, my name is Iris Brandes. I'm legal counsel at Ableton, or I'm um, head of the legal team. There's more legal counsels than me there. Uh, I'm Rob Coates. I'm a patent attorney at uh, Kilburn and Strode. I deal in software patents. Uh, I work with uh, Jim Miller and the team at Rowleaf on their patent and design applications. Okay. So we're just going to go over um, the different forms of IP. Then we're going to talk a little bit about trademarks, and then you're going to get your patent dose of patent. <coughs> patent. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, patents uh, are. Uh, as you said, basically for in, uh, inventions. Um, an invention is something that is uh, new, invent, has an inventive step, and basically for, uh, for well, here's an example, in fact, of a Steinberg software patent um, granted in the US. Um, there are different approaches in the, in the EU and US relating to software patents, which I'll get onto. But basically, uh, the patent is for an invention rather than the brand uh, or form or the other features, mm -hmm. um, which we'll get on to. Um, designs, so um, protect the appearance of an object there. Um, the, some of the more famous designs um, which we've had in the UK uh, um, case law, the trunky. Um, that's not an invention per se because we've just basically um, stuck wheels on a, on a piece of luggage. That, that had actually been done 100 years or so before, but what was worth protecting here was the idea of a, um, an animal kind of form of luggage um, which you, you could get your kid to ride on. Um, there was an interesting whole interesting bit of case law about uh, when this was copied um, and whether the the kind of alleged infringer um, was close enough to the design there um, to, to infringe. Similarly with the Apple iPad, um, the, the design registration actually related to the kind of the curvature and the, the form of the, um, the, the rear of the, the, the iPad, the Samsung uh, Galaxy tablet famously described as basically not as cool as the iPad in, in the <laughs> litigation. So it's really about the form and the, the, the appearance mm -hmm. rather than uh, an invention. The final thing was a, a Febreze bottle. Um, uh, yeah, basically we're talking about the form and the, the, the external features of an object. And it's interesting, in the US, a lot of these would be considered trademarks as well. And in the EU, they, they have this other design category. OK. So, so, so these are actually patents, design patents. So in, in, in the EU, we don't call them design patents. We, we have registered designs uh, and also unregistered design rights. Um, they have a slightly different duration, and um, designs aren't examined per se for, kind of, well, for, for inventiveness or anything like that. Uh, you basically register them, and, and then if you need to use or exercise your rights after the fact, uh, that's when that registration comes into play. And in the US, we do have design patents. So you could patent a design that's useful. And then if the design is not useful but still recognizable, you trademark that. So there's some differences going on between the US and the EU. Um, and then moving on to copyrights, which uh, protect original creative content. It doesn't have to be super creative, but it has to be a little bit creative. Um, and for example, there's uh, paintings and sculptures, pictures and books. Uh, code actually can be copyrighted. Um, and musical recordings, these are all pretty um, good examples of what can be copyrighted. Uh, the term of the copyright is for the life of the author plus 70 years. So it's a pretty long term. Um, you get the right to exclude others from, from copying or reproducing your copyright or displaying it, um, distributing it, or, or creating derivative works based on your copyright. So just because they, they didn't copy something identically, you could still stop, stop them if they, they sort of, it's a derivative of your own work. Um, and you don't have to register a copyright. I, I think in the EU, you, you actually cannot register it. That's true. 
And um, in the US, you can and you definitely get uh, uh, some benefits in registering it, like you, you get uh, attorney's fees, but you don't have to register it. You get rights upon the creation. And, and you, could, you don't even have to put the C symbol. That's a myth. But I would um, recommend that you do, just so people know that it's your copyright. Um, but yeah, so you're protected once you actually just start. Once you create your copyright, you have a copyright. Same in Europe. <clears throat> then we have trademarks. We already heard a lot about trademarks in the talk before. Here is an example of different forms of trademarks. You can trademark a word. Um, you can trademark um, drawing or any design. Um, you can combine those two of a d device and um, a word. You can also trademark a color, as you see the turquoise of Tiffany, or some people might know the pink or the magenta, it's called, of telecom. Also, you can trademark a shape or a 3D trademark, like the Coca-Cola bottle. Uh, sometimes this overlaps also with the uh, designs again. If mm -hmm. it's a, um, yeah, you can have a trademark for it as well as a design if both criteria <laughs> are uh, met. Also, you can uh, trademark a sound. This again is the sound um, you hear when, you, or the jingle you hear when you uh, have the telecom again. So. And then, finally, uh, trade secrets. Um, basically, if you uh, are achieving something through uh, means that you you want to keep secret, um, you can protect that by basically creating a system in which that is never released to the public. So uh, some examples here. <laughs> We've got the KFC secret 11 herbs and spices recipe. Um, uh, one of my old clients, a uh, oh, client I used to work uh, with, SwiftKey, decided that parts of their algorithm they would keep in-house and completely secret. Basically, it, this is useful when you have something that you can basically keep in a black box and you're confident that someone won't be able to re-engineer it uh, or that they won't be able to re-engineer it as well as you have done. So the problem with trade secrets is that once the secret is out of the box, you're into suing people for breach of trust or breach of contract and you can't put a secret back in a box once it's out of there. Um, yeah, Coca-Cola notably have managed to keep their recipe secret for over 100 years now, I think. Quite a long time. OK, quickly going over the trademark registration process. Um, just remember, trademark rights are territorial. So if you have, um, like for example, in the US, if you want a trademark registration, you will go to the Un United States Patent and Trademark Office. But you only get rights in the US. So just because you registered in the US doesn't mean that you could enforce that registration worldwide. This applies to all other countries I'm aware of as well. Um, and also to designs and to patents, although the IP right is ubiquitous. So once you have it, the goods flow, or also a work of authorship, a copyright is everywhere in the world. Always be aware of the problem that if you register with an, with an office, then um, it's protected uh, through registration for that territory. Um, however, for trademarks, going back to what we're talking about right now, um, there is means of registering tra a trademark beyond just one country. For instance, you can register for or apply for an EU trademark, um, and then you have with one registration um, territory or protection, trademark protection in 27 countries. Also, there's, um, there's international treaties which are meant to make it easier for you to use one trademark registration and then uh, extend the protection through the Madrid system, it's called. You go through an international office, which is in Switzerland, and then tell the office which territories you also want to apply for trademark protection. The only downside of this is that you all of a sudden deal, might have to deal with three offices who all have slightly different requirements, although it's meant to be one system. And um, this might be a good. Um, way for you to step in what you have to consider when you register. 
Yeah, so before registering, um, we saw some examples of uh, lawsuits before. So you, you probably want to hire an attorney and make sure that you aren't going to step on someone's toes and get sued for using a similar mark. And the standard of trademark um, infringement is likelihood of confusion. And so you're considering both the similarity of the marks and the similarity of the goods. So just because you own a trademark, doesn't mean that you could enforce it for every single industry. Um, you, your trademark is limited to the goods and services that you register it for. So you could have you know, two identical marks, one for software and one for toilet paper, and that's not necessarily going to cause confusion. Um, but then you could have two identical marks, one for restaurant services and, and one for uh, alcohol. And even though those aren't identical services, it's still probably close enough that it might cause some issues. So um, talking with a lawyer before going forward with your mark is probably a better idea than going forward with your mark and then having to deal with um, some infringement uh, suit. Other considerations? Yes, <clears throat> that was um, something uh, which applies to competitors more or less. So they will um, step on you, or you make have, have to make sure you don't step on their toes. But when you actually try to register with an office, you should also uh, make sure that the mark is somewhat distinctive, helps basically to, to uh, distingu distinguish your product from uh, a different brand, um, but also that it's not descriptive. So um, you can't really um, register Apple for any fruit, but you can or could register in the past Apple for hardware and software because this has not, nothing to do with the original product. Also, um, you might want to consider making up names that are not um, used for other things, so you have fancy names. Um, and um, also, um, sometimes there's catchy phrases which are in kind of in the air, um, and in this case, you also have to be aware that maybe other people also think this is a good name, and then it's uh, always hard to uh, be the first to get this trademark either in use or in registered. Um, and then talking about cost of, of registering a trademark, it's actually quite relatively cheap, considering that the brand is probably one of your most important assets of your company. Um, the filing fees in the US uh, are about $275 per classification. So there's 45 different classes of goods and services that you could register in. Um, for example, class nine is for software, class 15 is for musical instruments. So you might be falling into more than one class, but it's still relatively cheap. And, um, and then also, like I said before, you're, you're not going to get a trademark for every single thing in the world. Your trademark is going to be limited to what you're actually selling. And so you're going to, in the US, when you describe the goods, you're going to have to be quite detailed. Um, for example, you're not going to be able to get a trademark for software because that's way too broad. You're going to have to describe what kind of software your trademark is um, going to be used in connection with. In uh, Europe? It's slightly different. Um, what is the same is that also uh, Europe uses the NIS system, which means that you have the 45 classes for goods and services on which you can register or for which you can register your product. Um, however, you can actually register very broadly. So in, in Europe, it is possible to register um, a brand for software, meaning that it could be any kind of software. Um, and also, um, you could also register for all 45 classes, um, even though you don't use it, because you don't have to prove that you use it um, when you register. And also later, there is no need to prove. The only thing you need to be aware of, of course, it costs uh, to register 45 classes. And also, if somebody else likes your trademark and wants to use it for a product, um, which you haven't uh, actually used in the past five years, then uh, this competitor can uh, file for deletion from the register. And in the US, it's quite different. You have to use your mark before you get a registration. So you could file before you start using, but in the end, you actually have to use your mark. Um, and 
Also recognizing that before you go to re registration, your mark is gonna be published for third party opposition. So any third party can oppose your mark. And just be aware of these bigger companies. So think about these famous brands. They're all monitoring the publication of these marks. And it's not um, something unlikely if, if you're gonna get a opposition from a bigger company if your mark is somewhat similar to that company's mark. It doesn't have to be identical. Yeah, almost the same in Europe. It's registered and then there's a three months opposition period where competitors can actually um, file an opposition and then uh, it's to the office to decide whether they have a point or not with their uh, allegedly older mark. <clears throat> Um, and just quickly, going over the benefits of registration, again, I say if you can, if you can register, go for it. It's, it's quite cheap. Um, the benefits is that in the US, you get nationwide priority. So even though you're not using in every single state, you still get protection in all 50 states. Um, it's, it's proof of validity. So if you want to enforce your mark, all you have to do is say, look, I have this registration. Um, versus common law rights. So in the US, you actually still have rights in your trademark if you don't register it. If you, if you see the little TM symbol, that might designate a common law right um, mark versus an R circle symbol will designate that it's actually registered. But um, common law rights are much more limited. So for example, if you're a brick and mortar store located in San Francisco, you're only gonna have rights in San Francisco. You're not gonna have rights any, anywhere further. So the, the rights are limited to where you actually use. It's uh, again slightly different in at least continental Europe and um, that we have a strict first to file approach. It's all codified law. So we have our trademark acts which are pretty much harmonized throughout the European Union. And um, so if you use a trademark, in almost all cases, this doesn't help you unless you have registered the trademark for the exact use. Um, there are some common law rights for um, due to international treaties also, where you have a well-known mark, but this would mean um, if, there, if somebody's got a registration, you would have to prove that you have a well-known mark um, to overcome this registration. Okay, so moving on, saving the best for last, <laughs> the patents. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go for a, a, a patent monologue now. Um, <laughs> Patents, as I said, uh, they're a monopoly right. Um, they last for 20 years, and the monopoly right is granted territorially, similarly to trademarks. Uh, so in the, in the territories in which you file an application, and the bargain is that you get your 20 years monopoly in, uh, uh, on, the, on the condition that you publish the details of your invention. So patent applications are published uh, 18 months after they're filed. Um, Software can be patented both in the EU, EU and in the US and elsewhere, uh, <coughs> providing that your software is doing something new and inventive and the key part is technical. So the criteria, criteria um, we have an absolute novelty criteria globally, which means that if your invention has been disclosed either on a blog, uh, in the pub to your friends, uh, by, via white paper, then it's no longer new. And so at least in Europe, <clears throat> your application will fail for lack of novelty. There are some jurisdictions, notably the US, where you have a grace period uh, for accidental disclosures or basically disclosing before you file an application. Um, software as such is excluded from patentability. And that's kind of contradicts what I just said. So if, you're, but you're impl if your software is, sorry, if your invention is implemented in software, that's not to say that it is excluded. So we have to uh, consider whether your invention basically is a technical solution to a technical problem. That's basically the test that will be applied in Europe. The test that's applied in the US is to whether your invention relates merely to an abstract idea. So I think most of what people will be doing in this room, uh, developing solutions for audio, is most likely inherently technical producing, uh, for example, the, what uh, Julian was talking about this morning, systems with lower latency, that kind of thing. Although it's implemented purely in software, that is inherently technical and therefore patentable. 
Um, so examples of things you can patent. <clears throat> um, we work with Roly on the hardware and the function of the seaboard. Um, there's various applications pending for that. Ableton have um, patent applications to the function of the buttons and the form of the buttons uh, on their controllers, and also did US design patents for the look of those buttons, whereas the patent applications, the technical patent applications, will be the, the function and how uh, those buttons perform with relation to the controller. Um, Apple obviously have thousands of patents. Uh, one, I, one example I found in the audio space was encoding uh, EQ into the meta, EQ settings into the metadata of encoded audio files, which is then implementable on play out. So maybe using different EQ settings depending on the context in which an audio file is, play, is played out. That's the kind of thing that Apple are uh, working on. Um, Steinberg have uh, applied for improved methods for recovering spectral information, so cleaning up audio. That's the kind of thing that uh, is um, patentable. Um, the uses of patents, I guess, um, where we can, patents and, and patent applications are useful when attracting uh, investment. Obviously, investors want to know that their money is going to a company that takes IP seriously and is going to be protected from competitors and perhaps bigger players in the market. Um, patents can be used as obstacles to put in the way of your competitors if you're in a market where you know that there's a particular competitor you want to um, impede. Um, there's, all, there's, there's, there's an uncertainty while a patent application is pending which can cause your competitors basically to expend resources on working out whether they're going to have to design around uh, your invention. Um, so different approaches, um, I'm going to race through a few different approaches. Um, I know that in the room, basically, software developers usually are, have a quite a um, patents are somewhat antithetical to the open source that we all like to, um, the, yeah, the environment in which people like to operate. So let's go through. Apple, um, obviously, you know, they use the full range of uh, uh, means available to them to exploit their patent portfolio. They are involved in litigation both offensively and uh, defensively. They, uh, ex they um, obtain licenses for their patented inventions. Um, Famously, Twitter and Tesla, around five years ago, laid open all their patents. Now, Tesla did that basically to stimulate an ecosystem around their uh, technology that they'd already protected to try and hopefully uh, stimulate other developers to use their battery technology and hopefully create a bigger e ecosystem around their particular solution. Um, the Mozilla Foundation, who are you know, always championing open source. They have found patents to be useful for them when trying to leverage uh, in discussions with other tech companies to um, basically license parts of their technology solutions to, to work in conjunction with Mozilla. Um, they've never used them offensively, and they never will, I'm sure. But it's, it's, it's definitely useful when you're talking in licensing negotiations. Um, finally, Red Hat, um, they made a patent promise in 2002 that they would never use uh, any patents offensively. Um, they now have 2, 000, over 2,000 patents in their portfolio relating to um, all of the things that go on in, in, under, under the Red Hat. Um, Bonnet, um, you'll know that they were recently, in the last month or so, bought for $34 billion by IBM. And I don't think anyone in the room would deny that their substantial patent portfolio will have had a large part to play in that incredibly high valuation. Um, so the kind of the title of the, um, the talk was to file or not to file. There are obviously decisions about um, whether you're doing something technical, whether you think that something is patentable. But the key thing about all of those companies I just mentioned is that they have a strategy and they're sticking to it. Um, I don't think you can name a successful company that hasn't considered their IP, be it trademarks, be it designs, be it patents and come up with a plan. Um, the final 
kind of uh, final point I would make uh, on patents is novelty is really important, and so you have to be very careful when disclosing anything that, if it's in a meeting that you're talking uh, with non-disclosure agreements, um, that basically you talk to a patent attorney before you're making big public disclosures. I think that's all on patents. In it. Um, are there any questions now? Do we have, do we have any time for a few minutes of questions? We have maybe have time for one question, and all the others, if you could come to Backspace this afternoon. Actually, mine's a little tangential. Uh, it's not about, really about software, it's just on copyright. I've always wondered, um, if you put something on SoundCloud, um, and then later you want to sell that to like a library company or something, so it's here. Um, <laughs> Is it too late? Is it out of the bag at that point? Or if you were to take it down, if you were to sell it, do you still have the copyright? I, I guess you still have the copyright because you said copyright is based on creation. But would a company look on that badly and say, well, it's been in the open for a year, therefore it's no longer worth selling? You would still retain your copyright. So it's not like patents. There's no disclosure rule. So you could disclose as much as you want, and you still have your copyright. Does that answer your question? Thanks, everyone. Um, could we all put our hands together for the IP team? <laughs> so there'll now be a short break, and then we'll move on to the GDPR privacy talk at um, 12. <laughs>